I'd like to introduce Dr. Edward Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman is the Academic Director for the Master of Science program in Information and Knowledge Strategy at the School of Professional Studies. He's also the CEO of Knowledge Strategies LLC, which is engaged in research, education, and consulting services in support of organizational performance. Dr. Hoffman retired from NASA as a senior executive after 33 years. He was appointed the first NASA Chief Knowledge Officer in 2011 and held responsibility for system-wide strategy, integration, and deployment of knowledge services. Previously, he was founding director of NASA Academy of Program Project and Engineering Leadership, the top-rated project management academy in the world. He was also project manager of the NASA Strategic Management and Governance Handbook that established new governance and the Columbia for the Columbia shuttle accident. Dr. Hoffman has written and co-authored numerous journal articles and books. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Edward Hoffman. Thank you very much. Um, as uh, Dean Wingard said, uh, my focus would be about how teams relate in terms of my experiences, which goes back to NASA. So I served 33 years at NASA as the Chief Knowledge Officer and the Director of the NASA Academy. And during that time, my total focus was on developing capable people and high performance project teams in order to meet the mission requirements that we had. At NASA, I was known for saying that performance happens at the team level. And to illustrate my point, let me share what I call a tale of two shuttles. On February 1st, 2003, the space shuttle Columbia, number 107, disintegrated upon re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, killing all seven crew members. The ensuing Columbia Accident Investigation Board indicated that in addition to the technical causes of the failure, there were underlying organization factors that contributed to the failure. The report identified the need for a culture committed to organizational learning, where communication, collaboration, and openness of ideas would be the norm. Subsequent studies painfully pointed out the need for a culture of more effective communication and knowledge sharing. Six years later, the acting NASA Administrator Chris Scalise asked me to attend the Flight Readiness Review for Space Shuttle 119. I was asked to be in the decision room to watch for signs of how effectively we were working and collaborating as a team. Very early that morning, a problem was determined and it led to the focus of the discussion. On the previous shuttle flight, it was detected that there was an unexpected hydrogen flow increase from one of the shuttle's main engines. And the flow valve didn't operate as predicted. The cause of the flow valve problem was not understood by engineering, and there was not clear agreement on the potential impact. During the next 14 hours of review, I watched what would become one of the proudest moments of my career at NASA. The broad community of NASA, industry, and team partners would be engaged in active conversation, open sharing of ideas, transparent decision making, and intensive participation. I considered it one of the most impressive examples of collaborative teamwork that I had witnessed by a vast team under intense performance pressure. The eventual decision to launch would involve a team of over 1,000 people across the country communicating, collaborating, arguing, and innovating to achieve a solution. And only when safety said go would launch be considered. The engineering team would eventually design and patent a new non-invasive inspection technique. For me, the whole process I was watching represented exceptional collaboration that leveraged data, information, technology, and social capability. Later that night, as I was driving to my hotel, it was hard to believe that these two events, one catastrophic and one successful, occurred in the same organization almost exactly six years apart. And yet both involved the same organization, the same program, most of the same people, the teams, technology processes, and of course the same industry. So what can explain the extreme performance variability that I saw? And more importantly, how can we create conditions to better ensure outcomes of agility, coordination, and high performance? For me, this is one of the critical questions of organizational life 
and it continues to intrigue me to this day. And it's largely for that reason that I was so excited to join Columbia School of Professional Studies as academic director for the MS in Information and Knowledge Strategy. Along with technology analysis and data, high performance happens at the team level due to people who know how to collaborate and work together. The most important factor in high performing teams is people. And I can't express this enough. Most organizations verbalize and recognize the importance of people, but there's a lack of clarity as to what this means. So let's look at what became the NASA model for high performance teams. First, team performance is high when people are focused on the future of their work. This includes sharing knowledge, cultivating a culture of learning and honesty, where that's the norm. In the tale of two shuttles, one of the significant differences occurred in how each team handled learning. In our successful case, there was open exchange, communication, argument, dissenting opinions, and a commitment to learning through conversations. This is what I call the sound of success. There's an energy of engagement and interaction amongst the people. In the tragic Columbia disaster, there was limited open exchange and learning. A second dimension is focused on people also, but in relation to current events. Our most successful teams nurture an environment of respect and inclusion. All members feel that they're heard and have something to contribute. This doesn't happen by accident. During the 2009 shuttle review, a member of the team raised a point that clearly had nothing to do with the specific issue being discussed. It was a question about a separate discipline issue. The shuttle program manager, Bill Gerstenmeier, calmly asked whether the question had anything to do with this specific problem. The engineer said no, but she wanted to raise this as a future concern to be addressed. And Bill calmly asked if we could table the issue and come back to it at a future time. The engineer agreed and the meeting proceeded. This indicated a leader who respected and was inclusive of all the ideas being presented, and it encouraged participation for all topics and promoted a team of open exchange without fear. Today, most work is conducted across global teams. This raises the importance of building teams that respect and are inclusive of all its members. Let me shift now to the other side of the model. Effective teams also stay focused on the mission, the work that needs to be done. A third critical mention of high performance teams is that they embrace and have clarity about the importance of their work and the vision for success. Our most successful projects leveraged ideas, innovation, and possibility as a way to keep a team charging towards the future. Clarity about the vision and goals provides a fuel for seeking out ideas for improvement. During the failed Columbia mission, one of the most important characteristics was turning down ideas and different viewpoints. A safety engineer's ideas were shouted down as being irrelevant. NASA leadership did not request photos of the shuttle from another government agency since they were not deemed necessary. Those photos may have provided valuable information about the damage to the vehicle. During the successful shuttle mission, over 1,000 people were engaged in intensive activity seeking solutions and answers. A new inspection technique would be patented during investigation. And this innovation was developed in a team culture that was committed to no launch until answers had been identified. So the purpose of the mission contributed to the ideas, innovations, and blue sky uh, thinking that led to the solutions. The fourth dimension represents a focus on the work that needs to be accomplished and establishing management processes for operational effectiveness. This is the dimension of management, process, standards, roles, and governance that contributes to best practice. This needs to be tailored to the context, but it provides a framework for how we are successful in our organization. NASA employed standards for management of complex projects and programs based on decades of expertise and knowledge Methods were used because they contributed to safety and success. So performance happens at the team level, and we know what leads to successful teamwork. However, it requires hard work, resources, and perseverance. Successful leaders are focused on people and mission. They approach these dimensions in the present time and with an eye on the future. 
Successful leaders take the time to build and maintain teams through the discipline of building team capability, through discussion of these dimensions, and assessment of performance, coaching, and tools that promote the health of the team. In my NAS experience, it's the greatest risk factor and truly the only competitive advantage for an organization to focus on our people within the context of the mission.